Welcome to this traffic safety webinar sponsored by the North Carolina Governor's Highway Safety Program. This is one in a series of webinars addressing topics of interest for traffic safety professionals. The series is co-hosted by the Institute for Transportation Research and Education at NC State University and the University of North Carolina Highway Safety Research Center. Today's topic is Overcoming DUI and DWI Defenses presented by Jeff Cyphers, Assistant District Attorney with Oklahoma's 6th Judicial District, and Ashley Slott, Traffic Safety Resource Prosecutor for the State of Wyoming. It's my pleasure now to welcome Sarah Garner with the North Carolina Conference of District Attorneys who will introduce our presenters. Sarah? Thank you so much, Eugene. Hey, everyone. We're glad to have you with us this afternoon, and we're going to continue with our Traffic Safety Webinar Series, giving you some high quality information from all around the country. We've had some other TSRPs uh, present for us already, but this pair, Jeff is a former TSRP, are two of my favorites. Jeff had served as the traffic safety resource prosecutor in Oklahoma for over nine years and is now back in the trenches with the prosecutors um, trying cases. As a matter of fact, he's in the middle of a trial as we speak. And as soon as he gets done sharing some information with us, he's got to go back in and finish up his trial. He worked in private practice for six years before he became the TSRP, um, working primarily defending impaired driving, which puts Jeff in a, a unique position. He's seen both sides of the fence. He's on the right side of the fence now, but he also understands how a defense attorney works. Um, and as I've told so many prosecutors before, when you're reviewing your case, review it as a defense attorney would. Look for the holes in it, which is what um, Jeff and Ashley are gonna talk to us about today. And he's a graduate of the Oklahoma City University School of Law. And as a resident of Oklahoma, I would like to welcome him officially to the Southeastern Conference, which of course, uh, at the University of Tennessee is one of the original members. Anyway, uh, you will enjoy what Jeff has to say. Along with Jeff, we also have Ashley Schluck. Ashley is the TSRP for the state of Wyoming and has served in that position since 2013. She also serves as a senior assistant city attorney in Laramie, Wyoming. I've been to Laramie and it's absolutely fascinating because you're way up in the air, but you don't realize it because it's, it's a high mountain um, plain, beautiful town. She served for eight years as um, Laramie's assistant city attorney. She prosecuted impaired driving, alcohol and drug related and was such a, a, a wonderful resource for, towards impaired driving and combating impaired driving. She assisted in the creation and enactment of some tougher laws in her city. And she is a graduate of the University of Wyoming, which is also a beautiful place. I've had the pleasure to get to see that as well. So pay attention to this pair. They do a wonderful job. I've seen them present before on, on um, the, the generalized defenses that defense attorneys come up with all the time, have some unique ideas on it. And I think you will find this to be a very informative um, presentation. And Jeff and Ashley, it's all you folks. Thank you, Sarah. Right. Thanks, Sarah. Let me you know how awesome it is to be back in the state of Carolina, North Carolina, that is. It's uh, I've missed y'all. I really have. <laughs> we Ashley, miss you too, my friend. Ashley, if you, yep. There we go. It. We see your All slides. Right. You're ready to go. <laughs> Thank you. So this is a talk that we've given a couple of times. Uh, and many of you have uh, probably thought about this before, but never given it the title that I have here. Uh, this idea, the, the theme of this whole talk is going to be death by a thousand cuts. And it's going to be an overview of the defense analysis in DUI cases. Now, I mean, listen, here's the thing. You could probably summarize this entire talk in about four or five seconds by saying the defense says that everything in this case is and then fill in the blank. It, you know, think of my cousin Vinny. Um, but I think it's a, probably a little bit more detailed than that. And so as a quick disclaimer, um, I love disclaimers because, you know, you can point to them and say, yeah, did you read it? This is, um, this is not a talk that is going to be specific to any one particular defense. It's not going to be the, uh, official North Carolina perspective on anything. It is simply going to be Jeff and Ashley's take on how you can better anal analyze your cases so that you can rule in the good stuff and rule out all the stuff that, uh, well, again, see the Mike has any definition of a defense interpretation. 
So recognize please at the beginning that this is uh, a single perspective from two folks who have done this talk a number of times and taken the counsel and advice from other parties in the room and listened to their stories and tried to reconcile the defense perspective so that we can kind of have a better you know, case when we get to the trial. And much of what we're gonna talk about has been shaped by, frankly, it's been shaped by you folks who are listening to us right now, kind of giving us ideas and feedback. And uh, so this is a living document. This is gonna be kind of a living practice. So just know that this is uh, one perspective that can be shaped by your other TSRPs and your other folks in North Carolina. So uh, Ashley, you wanna add anything to that? Just that, you, yeah, I was just going to say, we aren't going to talk about anything specific according to, you know, case law statutes, none of like that. We're going to talk more in theory, and then you can apply that theory to your actual case law and statutes and how you apply uh, it to your case in pr preparation for your DUI case as well. And so really what this, this event, this talk is, is themed towards is how do you as prosecutors, how do you as law enforcement officers, how do you structure your case in a DUI, DWI case specifically, so that you have all of the power and you leave the defense with little to nothing? Because this is a talk about retaining and fortifying your power as you go to court. And so, you know, when you start thinking about what is a case, right, when we start thinking about what why is a case strong? Why is a case weak? Um, we can probably identify those pretty easily, right? I mean, generally speaking, the great cases that we have end up in a plea. We very rarely see trials as a result of a case that is, you know, strong in the, in the state's favor. And on the other hand, you very rarely see a trial on a case where it's really bad, you know, for the state because you deal with it, you know, at some point. But the most difficult ones for us to evaluate are the ones where it's a he said, she said. You understand what your facts are going to be and what you believe them to be. You've seen an affidavit. You've created an affidavit. You've created a, a report. You've, you've analyzed it to the point where you think you know as much about your case as you can or more than other people. And then the defense comes in and says, yeah, so everything you thought was true is not. And here's why. And so when you've got a he said, she said, or you've got a 5149 type of scenario, those are the cases that are most difficult to evaluate. And the defense attorney is standing before you asking you to trust the information that he's been giving, given to you, he or she, as truth. And how do you know whether it's truth or whether it's just a defense interpretation of things that they learned at their seminars, which is different than what you learned at yours? How, why are those cases the most difficult to evaluate? And with that too, um, and with there's a, a list of, and Jeff talked about some of that, but with that, the reason that these cases are difficult are, are the reasons that we as prosecutors are always complaining, like, you know, and we're telling our law enforcement officers, you need to have more detailed reports, you need to put everything in them. And so if they're incomplete or they're not detailed, then that lends to defense um, credibility in their arguments. And so also asking the right questions and doing a thorough investigation, making sure that you're covering all those bases, because I know that when I've had been handed cases that why didn't you ask this or why didn't you find that information? Because the jurors want to know the answers to those questions. And so if you're not getting those answers on the scene at the time, you're probably never going to really get those true answers um, to how they were at that date and time on the scene during your investigation. Because what will happen likely is uh, the questions that the juror wants to know or the jury wants to know, they're going to be answered by the defense attorney after the defendant has had an opportunity to sort of craft what they're going to say, not saying they're lying, but they're going to direct the jury to believe what it is that they want them to believe if you're not getting those answers during the investigation on the scene. So that also doesn't help. And that's why we are constantly as prosecutors telling our, um, our police officers to do a better job at you know getting those answers and, and forming those questions and getting that evidence. Well, there's another factor that comes into this and that's the idea of a burden of proof, right? And there is this, this disconnect in some ways between law enforcement's role in investigating cases 
versus the re responsibility of the prosecutor to prove those cases in a court of law. I mean, if we were all sitting around and I look forward to the opportunity when I can, and I'm sure Ashley agrees with me, when we can actually sit down and have conversations with, with folks in person and ask these questions, uh, you know, personally, you know, if I were sitting in a room, in a room with law enforcement and, and a combined uh, audience of, of prosecutors, I'd ask law enforcement, so what's your burden when you're out there to make an arrest? What do you have to have? Well, probable cause. Well, do you see why your investigation might fall short of that reasonable doubt or beyond a reasonable doubt standard that a prosecutor might need? And when you look at this graphic, it, it makes sense, right? Because there's a disconnect for what is required to take someone's uh, limited freedom, right? To, to seize them, to place them in jail under suspicion of a, of a crime, put handcuffs on them, have their car towed. That all it requires is you have probable cause to arrest. And many times when you develop that probable cause, you write it in the affidavit for that purpose. And then when we get to court, you know, when the defense comes in and says, well, I, I agree, it's, it's likely that, you know, it's probable, heck, it's likely that my client was guilty, but that's not enough. I need, you've got to have to prove it beyond a reasonable doubt. And so there is that disconnect that exists between the officer's true and correct effort in the things that they do on a daily basis, and then what the prosecutor's responsibility is in court. And somehow we can close, I think we can close that gap. I really do think that we can close that gap um, together uh, in, in terms of an investigation, because officers, will, if you start thinking towards the reasonable doubt standard, I think that we close that gap together and we can work on making cases better. But um, the, the idea of the roles of the, of the parties, you know, when you start thinking about why people do the things that they do in court, you know, or why they do certain things. I mean, if we look at the roles, right, to think about why the defense does the things that they do, you know, law enforcement officers, your job is to ascertain like the true facts of a particular crime, right? You are sent to a domestic violence call. You arrive, you get on the porch, there are a man and a woman, and they are both out in the woods and they barely speak uh, a word of the King's English, but they're both bloodied, they both have split knuckles and they're both pointing at one another saying they did it. What do you do? You have to reconcile all the facts and try to figure out what the truth of that matter is. So your job is truth, right? And so that's how you do your thing. And the prosecutor, when they get that, what you believe is true, their job is to do justice. We as prosecutors have to do what we think is required in the case to see justice done, not necessarily just to win, but to figure out what justice is. I mean, justice is defined by a lot of different people, a lot of different ways. Justice might be burying the person under the jail for what they did, or at least their intent, intent to do that. And it also might mean dismissing a case because the case isn't good enough to make the, the burden of proof, you know, beyond a reasonable doubt. And there's all sorts of different interpretations in between. And sometimes justice and truth, unfortunately for Superman, these don't always match up. Uh, but then you figure out the defense. What's their role? And... Uh, this PowerPoint for every time that we do this, there is the inclusion of what I believe is uh, one of the favored perspectives from my co-presenter here about how some defense attorneys present themselves in the shape of Pennywise. Um, but they could be the angry prosecutor, they could be the devil, they could be lazy, they could be Janice, right? The two-faced God who tells you one thing in the courtroom but wants to play golf with you and ask you questions about another case on the, court, on the golf course. Or they could just be the slick, dump truck lawyer who walks in and they're never going to ask you a question. They're just going to try to plead the case. And what's bad for prosecutors and bad for law enforcement is you never know what you're going to get. You kind of do. If you know some names, you, uh, you could prepare for them. But uh, it's, it's our responsibility to figure out who is who in this, in this spreadsheet and how we respond to them. Because, you know, we might be more apt to respond to a a lazy lawyer in kind versus somebody who is a trial lawyer who's going to come after us every time. We might change our approach, but I would submit that we don't need to. And so um, I think what we're going to try to do is kind of expose the classified defense playbook from here on out. 
again, we're not in public, we're not together with one another. So I'd probably ask you, you know, if we were sitting around, I'd ask you what this number means to you. And some of y'all will tell me how many problems Jay-Z has. Um, you might even go so far as to tell me that it's, uh, I don't know, pick, an, pick something. But I would then ask you to, if it's anything less than 100, what is that in terms of, in terms of a defense's perspective on be a reasonable doubt? And then you would agree with me that this is anything less than 100 is equal to reasonable doubt. So therefore, anything less than a perfect impaired driver is equal to reasonable doubt. And that's where the thousand cuts and death by a thousand cuts come from. But you know, in Oklahoma, uh, we got some popularity and I would submit that most people not from Oklahoma see it this way. So with that too, and we have to think about that with our 99 number, um, because really in reality, 99 is, is not reasonable doubt. Like anything less than 100 is not reasonable doubt. So we're gonna have to approach these cases and how we can present it to the jury because we are not always going to have a perfect DUI. And that's why it's going to trial is because it's not perfect because there are missing pieces to the puzzle because there are um, you know, some holes and, and gaps in our evidence. So we need, to, we need to talk about the case. We need to bring the attention to the jurors or the judge, whoever the case is going in front of, to basically point out that, you know, reasonable doubt doesn't exist just because we have a piece or two missing. Um, you can still look at the totality of everything and still see the impairment, even though we don't have the perfect case that we expect, that we don't have the CSI, um, you know, aha moment where everything just kind of comes in line. So we really need to be able to prepare for that and describe that and explain how, you know, there may be some one or two things missing here, but that does not give you any reasonable doubt because really at the end of the day, everything points to one thing and one thing only, and that would be impairment and that DUI. So really what we're gonna do is we're going to take you through the ideas and the lens that the defense sees these cases through so that we can kind of work towards identifying the doors and in the hallway that might be wide open of our case and we close them either pre-trial or in trial through effective direct, you know, direct questions um, or you know, even well before we get into the, the prosecutor's office with an effective affidavit. But we close those doors so that when you know the most honorable defense counsel whenever they get there whoever they might be the people you trust the most you need to understand that when we start looking through their lens their job is to search for everything except the truth and so with that in mind and with that premise this is where we're going to start we're going to turn the world upside down a little bit and we're going to try to start thinking a little bit backwards, because if we can start thinking a little bit backwards, then there is nothing they can do to us once we get to the final destination, because all the evidence will be ours and not theirs. So how does this stuff always start, prosecutors, when you get in the courtroom? And by the way, I'm always, you know, I'm always talking about this guy. You always see this young, sharp dressed lawyer that walks in and says, hey, you got a problem with your case. Well, in this scenario, this is my son. He was getting ready to go to the prom, and the only thing he'd have a problem with that night is he was running late. So, but in most of those cases, you have a you know you have a problem with your case, and it's always some young unknown who comes in and says, "I know more than you." Well, does he or doesn't? Does she or doesn't she? How do you make that determination? I mean, is it smoke or is it fire? And if it's smoke, is it advocacy? right? Is it substance? You know, how do you know whether or not what's coming out of their mouth actually affects your case and will burn your case down? Or if it's just smoke and you can just walk through it like for what it is, how do you determine what those things are? Well, I would submit to you that when you start looking to see what's smoke and what's fire in your case, that when you start looking at, you know, fire, remember that every piece of evidence is gonna be something that's offered to support a fact and issue. So if there is something that is being offered to keep your case from coming in, a 
a breath test, a blood test, field sobriety tests that were done incorrectly, uh, a DRE that's missing a step. Those are likely going to be pieces of evidence that are being offered to support a fact and issue, and they'll try to strike it. DREs, if you're listening to me, they're one of the things that is definitely a piece of fire is going to be your FRE or your federal rule of evidence, your North Carolina code about the ability to testify as an expert, whether you've got the appropriate knowledge, training, education, experience, or skills to take the witness stand to talk about the things you want to talk about. If you're missing those things, then you're going to need to firm up your, your qualifications, your, your curriculum vitae, or your resume. Uh, things that point towards reliability of a thing or admissibility of a thing, those are fire. The other stuff is courtroom drama. That's cross-examination. That's nothing more than the stuff that's offered for the hearing of the jury to show that whatever conclusion you drew is the wrong one. And it's always going to be through cross-examination. And it's likely always going to be something to do with a particular piece of protocol, you know, like the standardization of field tests or I mean, heck, I guess if they had to, that did you orderly dress, you know, dress yourself in your class A's for court today? I don't know. But it's going to be something to do with protocol. And that's simply going to be smoke. And it'll be something that's like a death of a thousand by a thousand cuts. The small, the most amount of cuts and nicks that I can make to this case means it bleeds more. And if it bleeds, that means that there is reasonable doubt. This is the defense MO. It is the defense 101. And so remember, as we start reconciling those things, you know, if you can, you know, dif differentiate between smoke and fire, you can invest, invest your time appropriately and close the doors up front. So we have to even think about these cases, too. Um, I know that in our DUI manuals and what law enforcement's taught and what we, we, we teach law enforcement, what NHTSA has is, you know, they have the three phases of a DUI arrest. But we really have to think of this as prosecutors, because the juries are going to think of this this way, because the defense attorneys think of this way, is there's really the four phases of DUI arrest. So we've got the traditional vehicle in motion, personal contact, the pre-arrest screening, SFSTs. But then the fourth phase is really the chemical test. And that's where the defense attorney is probably going to have the most fodder. And that's the reason that they have that fourth quotes phase is because of that, because that's where they have the most um, information that they can attack where they can understand that the jury doesn't really understand these things and this is where that they can go and attack those things as well so um, we live in a csi day and csi is coming back if y'all didn't know it'll be back in uh, <laughs> this fall so we're really going to have to go with those challenges again because you know csi is something that people watch people watch the courtroom dramas and they expect the aha moment so that is why we have to really consider that as, as our fourth phase And so when you start thinking about cases and you start analyzing cases, you law enforcement, you prosecutors, y'all have all been trained the exact same way. So we, you know that when we start looking at them, you know that every DUI is kind of this linear process, right? Starts at point A and ends at point C, D, or E. And it's always best to look at it that way because that's how the defense is going to approach it too. You know, so vehicle in motion, personal contact, pre-arrest screening, did you do field tests or a PVT? You know, what was there, was there a chemical test? What kind was it? Uh, did you get an immediate result or have you had to wait for the blood test? And then obviously there's a jail. And I would submit that you should analyze each of these levels, each of these steps as a highlighter moment and anticipate cross-examination specific to those particular levels. And that makes sense, right? You've seen it before, but there are soft areas of every case. And those soft areas, the ones that are probably most attacked are things like, you know, traffic violation. Why that car get put on the side of the road? And more important, what about that stop was good for me as opposed to what was bad for me? And then you got field tests. You know, it's just like following a recipe. Field sobriety tests just are like, you know, when we tell a jury, by the way, there's elements to a crime and it's just like following a recipe. If I have peanut butter and jelly, or I'm trying to make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and all I've got are peanut butter and jelly, then I, did I make the sandwich because I didn't have any bread? I mean, it's the same concept with SFSTs. If I don't follow the standardization, 
do I finally get the end result that I that I'm claiming actually occurred? And then you know, same kind of analysis applies to DRE, but even you know on steroids because DRE is a much bigger problem for the defense, and so there may be a lot more question. And then obviously, chemical testing, chemical testing is a problem, but let's be honest. Defense attorneys, while they are getting better at science, they don't like science because most lawyers went to law school because we don't math. And so uh, chemical testing might be a battle of the experts, but it's unlikely to result in any problem for law enforcement and prosecutors. You've got experts that you can turn to as well. But we need to look through the lenses of these soft areas to see whether or not they exist and then start firming them up. And so the defense will always take the same approach, in my opinion, to each case, and they are the, it's always the same thing. It's what I refer to as the DUI defense trinity. And before we get into that real quick, um, okay. so with that, uh, we have to like think about and recognize why these areas are soft areas. And the reason that they are soft areas is because they are areas that, by and large, the general public, I eat your jury, does not necessarily understand. SFSTs, they think of those as, you know, roadside Olympics, or there's, you know, that notion that they're, you know, done and not even sober people can do them. Um, DRE, like that just seems like an, an law enforcement officer trying to be a medical examiner of sorts. Chemical testing, as Jeff said, lawyers go to, to law school to because they don't math and they also don't science. So unless you've got somebody with a science background, on your jury, you may not have somebody who understands the science behind it. So these are areas that are really easy to attack because the juries aren't familiar with them um, as they should be. So you're probably gonna have to do some education, not only in your jury voir dire, but also in your opening and in your closing and your law enforcement officer is gonna have to do that education on these things when they are on, their direct, on the stand for direct because the reason these are soft areas is because they're easy areas to attack because jurors aren't familiar with them and jurors don't understand them. Now you can go into your trinity. I will gladly go into my trinity. So the thing about it is, you know, when Ashley and I were doing this long, many, many years ago when we first started talking about it, I sat down and I tried to figure out exactly what MO does every defense attorney follow in every impaired driving case. And I came up with this idea. The idea is that they will do one of three things on all circumstances. They will try to suppress, substitute, or ignore the evidence, period. Now, what does that mean? Well, obviously, if they can suppress something, they can keep it out in the defense. You know, if they are successful, if the jury can't hear it, they can't consider it. Consider it. They don't even know it exists. So, you know, if there is a test case that the test comes and stays out, then that's, a, that's obviously now a refusal case, essentially, because they've got nothing to compare it to. But it's also sometimes they know they're going to lose that suppression, but they can use it as a quasi-preliminary hearing because they know that you will be called law enforcement as, a, as an expert or as a witness, and they will use it to create a transcript so that they can hold you accountable when it comes time to go to trial if they do end up in trial. So it may simply be a tool to create a record for cross to hold you, you know, to your to your your, your statements. On the flip side, as with all things, the meat where the rubber meets the road, quite literally, in a DUI defense is via cross-examination. And that is how they build reasonable doubt. We substitute all things that point towards. Uh, sobriety or towards your confusion or your rush to judgment or your misinterpretation of evidence and basically allow for that cross-examination of alternate explanations or any kind of concessions that you might give us, right? And so that's essentially basic, you know, saying that we're going to change the, the focus of the jury. We're changing the lenses that folks are going to be looking through, right? Because if we can create you know, we want the clear picture as the prosecutor and as the as law enforcement, we know the truth, but if we can make it fuzzy, if we can muddy the water at, from the defense side, then the jury is left with only, you know, the, the single verdict because that means that they're filled with reasonable doubt and not, you know, the idea of beyond a reasonable doubt. So, um, you know, just a word about, about those things. Remember who your audience is, right? As you're preparing your reports, as you're preparing your, your communications and your, your, your testimony and your predicate questions of prosecutors, remember that you're telling the jury about this case. You're telling them the truth about it. 
So remember your audience. Um, you know, around here, my juries tend to look like this. Um, I don't know about North Carolina, but I'm waiting to see what this jury is going to do to my wonderful human that I'm about to do closing arguments on in about 25 minutes. Um, but, you know, obviously when the defense gets to the courthouse, you know, there's only one reason that the person was driving drunk. And that's, you know, aliens. It had nothing to do with anything else. It's aliens. Um, I don't know if this is my defense attorney in this case or not. His hair is not quite that. Long. So with the substitution one... in this regard, it's really important that you as prosecutors and you and as law enforcement officers, that you always bring those substitutions back to, you know, yeah, these things are possible not probable, but possible, because that's what they're going to ask you. They're going to ask you for the possibility of these things. However, when you look at things and you can say, I mean, it's possible that this could happen. However, everything else points to impairment. Everything else points to this person is impaired by whatever substance they're impaired by, because it's really easy to throw the kitchen sink at you and have explanations for everything. And this is where the defense attorneys really have to balance things, because if they get too over the top and they're explaining too much away, then it's going to look that that's exactly what they're doing. And so they lose their credibility. But always bringing that back and pointing it back to impairment will help your case uh, really in the long run because jurors can agree that, you know, if there's a whole bunch of stuff present and the one explanation for everything is impairment, that's probably the likely culprit. The other part of the substitution that is largely many times ignored uh, on our side, you know, to our, to our dismay, but certainly something that the defense focuses on is the good stuff. What good happened? What good things point towards the, um, the actual conclusion that the person was driving impaired as opposed to the bad stuff that, or the, that he wasn't as opposed to the bad stuff that says that he was. And so the good stuff in cross-examination will come not just with the questions that go to support their case, but those questions will also be things that um, point towards innocence, right? And so obviously you, those of you who've been on the witness stand before or uh, prosecutors who've been in the courtroom with law enforcement or with uh, defense attorneys before know that 30 minutes of uh, testifying occasionally being interrupted by the witness with a yes or no answer is easily the defense definition of cross-examination. Um, I would submit to you that our analysis today and going forward, especially for you prosecutors, is to start with the single question that I used to start every cross-examination with back in the day. And that is this, officer, could you be wrong? Now, the question is one that doesn't have an easy answer. If you start by answering by saying, yeah, it's possible, then that's basically admitting that your case, at least in the defense perspective, that it's admitting your, your case probably has some issues. And that's okay, because just like Ashley said, there's a lot of things that are possible, but not everything is reasonable. Not everything is true. And so Remember that if you start with, officer, could you be wrong? Follow it up with this next question. Why aren't you wrong? Because if you're, ret let's return back to the idea of the four phases of a DUI arrest. If we turn back to that four phases of a DUI arrest, there are always going to be something that we can point to in the vehicle in motion, your misinterpretation of a traffic violation that put them on the side of the road. There's always going to be some sort of claim that you misinterpreted the signs and symptoms of, you know, odor of cannabis, odor of marijuana, you know, odor of uh, alcoholic beverage, the absence of either of them, you know, uh, the disheveled clothing, bloodshot eyes, everything can point to some sort of misinterpretation. And then obviously with your pre-arrest screening, there's obviously there's going to be something that's going to be claimed that you're wrong. And then uh, moving through, you're already there. So how do you get there, right? And like in vehicle in motion, Say, for example, you pull somebody over for speeding. I mean, that's probably one of the most common things that people get pulled over for at a DUI. At least that's been my experience for the last 16 years. Mm -hmm. And so when you say you pulled the officer, you, how did you uh, effectuate a traffic stop in this matter? I pulled him over for speeding. Okay, cool. So prosecutor read, reads speeding, defense reads, all right, well, great. 
Officer, isn't it true that speeding is not one of the cues that needs a study to uh, detect impairment in, in, in nighttime traffic stops? And the truth to that is, yeah, speeding was not one of the 20 cues that were of detecting drivers at night. So it doesn't directly have any relationship to impairment. And then here comes the analysis. Here's the good stuff. So the did the officer, uh, when you have turned on your, your, uh, your, your lights and effectuated a traffic stop, did my client immediately slow down? Did he swerve? He didn't weave. He didn't strike the curb. He didn't drift. He didn't straddle a lane line or attempt to flee. And as a matter of fact, he didn't do anything besides pro properly yield to your lights, did he? So you tell me and you're telling the jury that he did one thing wrong and I just gave them eight things that he did right. So if you're not watching for those things when you're making the traffic stop, amongst all the other things you're doing in your life at that point, right? Like staying safe, trying to avoid getting hit by oncoming traffic, making sure the person doesn't abscond, right? Be watching out for these things too, because these are the questions that might come when somebody starts asking you the uh, questions under cross. The same so, holds too with personal contacts. So you're going to get the questions on cross-examination, like if the individual admitted drinking, the defense attorney is going to basically say, so like it's legal to drink and, and drive as long as you're under the legal limit. It's okay to, you know, have, have a glass of wine or a, you know, a glass of beer or what, whatever it is that you're drinking, as long as you're safe to do so. And as long as you're under the legal limit, and as long as you're not impaired. Um, they're going to, as we talked about, they're going to substitute things like your bloodshot eyes will suddenly become allergies. Um, and then the odor of alcohol, as I just described, it will anticipate that social drinking, that it's okay to have a beer as long as you're not over the legal limit. And so then if you're talking about other things too, um, if you were talking about drugs and whatnot, uh, you know, you're not going to know as a police officer what normal looks like is that that may just be the way that they are. And this holds true with kind of the other personal observations. So their speech patterns and the way that their eyes look um, and the way that their clothes are, you know, if they're disheveled or not, you don't know if that's the way that they are normally. So, you know, when you get that, that, that I've only had a couple of beers, sometimes that can mean a whole lot of things. So if you're not getting more information from them and you're not pinning down what exactly that means, I've also found too that officers who are really good at investigating things, if they ask follow-up questions, so they say, I only had two beers. Uh, and they say, and what else? Then they usually they'll be like, oh, and I guess I had a shot of fireball. And what else? Well, and then I guess I had two more beers at this place. So sometimes you can get more information because they almost know that if you're doing the follow-up questions, that means, oh, this officer knows I've had more than two beers. He knows that my two beers is kind of a BS story. Um, so that is something that's important to recognize with that. Same holds true for pre-arrest screening. You're going right. to hear... They'll, go ahead, Jeff. I was just going to say, one thing to keep in mind, though, back on that personal contact is if we eliminated all of the explanations, what's the one and only thing that point that all of those things collectively point to, right? All of those things go to support them each other. The admitted to consuming alcohol would lead to an odor of alcoholic beverage. The odor of alcoholic beverage and admitted to drinking will inform and advise and create bloodshot watery eyes, right? And so you think in terms of sometimes just because they want to leave certain things on an island and by themselves, when done that way, they will always find not impaired. But collectively, everything informs the, each other. So that totality of circumstances that you have already adopted and know and, you know, as a buzz term, that's what all that means. Is it possible these things could have happened? Yes, but the odor of alcoholic beverage in her admission to drinking caused me to think that her bloodshot eyes was not allergies, but actually impairment. So, sorry, move oh, on to this. Great, that was good. Um, and then to go to the SFSTs, really, when they are talking about SFSTs, we'll go, we'll dive a little deeper into this as we talk. Um, you know, you say perform poorly on the SFSTs. And they are going to be like, I want to get my manual out and I'm going to ask you every obscure question from the manual. I'm going to take things completely out of context. And so they oftentimes the defense attorneys know your manual 
uh, law enforcement officers, and even prosecutors. They know the manual better than you do. So I would always encourage law enforcement officers, prosecutors, you know, to take a look at the manual every so often. And if you know you've got a DUI trial coming up, you better be looking at that manual a few times and know where the good stuff is. And Jeff and I will give you some of the places where the good stuff is for, you know, DUIs in general as they relate to SFSTs. But there's a lot of really good information contained within the manual that, you know, a defense attorney will like to take out of context where they'll only read a portion of the manual if they're going to be asking you questions on it. And then they also like to attack the SFSTs by really tapping into that jury's unfamiliarity with these uh, maneuvers by trying to attack the you know, science behind it. And, you know, did the officer really do it standardized like they were supposed to? And if they didn't do it standardized, then, you know, they must not be reliable if they screwed up in any way, shape or form. And so they're really going to say, uh, you know, these SFSTs don't show us much of anything. And so you really need to be able to think about and testify to how these SFSTs do show impairment and how, they're, how impairment is related to driving. And that's how you're going to be able to relate the two with the SFSTs to show that you need to make judgments, decisions, you have to act on things, you have to do certain things. And that's why we have those divided attention uh, tests. So they really will em emphasize that standardized component of the SFSTs. Um, and so you have to know that there is some language within the manual that, you know, it's not essential that you you can do the SFSTs perfectly at every time. And sometimes you're not even gonna get the perfect weather conditions. And so really it accounts for that. But if you don't know where that is in the manual where it says, you know, not ideal conditions are always going to be met, um, you are gonna have issues and you're gonna have a defense attorney that's gonna come at you not saying that, you know, if you're not doing it in the prescribed manner, that then somehow you can't really rely on them because they're not really gonna show you what you need them to show. This language is from older manuals. Those of you who have been around a little bit longer know that this language was in existence in the manuals that were, you know, from the 06s and the, you know, the 08s kind of revisions, the earlier revisions. But this language and this admonishment and this, you know, advisory has been brought forward in multiple revisions coming forward regarding, you know, rigid standards of the scientific community. Um, and the idea that, you know, there is a, a differences between validated testing and, and standardized testing. You know, the idea of, of validation versus standardization is something that is, you know, you have to know that if you don't do these things the way that they were prescribed, potentially the validity of your call is wrong. And then you look at, you know, going forward, here we are again, the same kind of the admonishment to not deviate from the SFSTs. So what's also important to note is that as you look in the language of the manuals, you will also be you know, admonished as officers that the idea that slight variations from the idea, the ideal, you know, the inability to find a perfectly smooth surface at roadside or, or you know, the wetness of a roadway or whatever, don't necessarily make the SFSTs and SFSTs invalid. And so I always like to give this analogy. And frankly, since it's lunchtime, it seems appropriate. You know, I don't know if y'all are aware of this, but uh, I like to eat and I'm good at it. Um, and one of the things that I like to do is I like to bake. And many people are not aware of the fact that when you start making chocolate chip cookies, you can change the basic structure of a cookie and vary the things to the point where you're doing like all shortening, which is not my favorite, but whatever. Uh, you can do all butter, you can put baking soda in it, you can make chilled butter, all grain. You can vary it all day long and you'll still get a chocolate chip cookie unless you do one, of, unless you do one thing. And that is not put a stinking chocolate chip in it. Now look, these are the best ways that you can eat chocolate chip cookies, in my opinion, but that's neither here nor there. The short answer to an attack of the standardized protocols of SFSTs is law enforcement, do your dead level best to do exactly what your training coordinators and your people told you to do. Don't rainbow or windshield wiper your HGN passes. Do all of your passes. Count your clues the way you're supposed to, right? Do VGN. Get all them eight clues, do your walk and turn, 
do a PBT or a one leg stand, do a PBT, and then call it good. But if you leave something out, do not be sold on the idea that by forgetting what a clue was, even though you didn't count it or the road was wet or something, the simple fact that you buried a particular thing does not change the phenomenon that occurs by using a substance too much into affecting your body to you know, accommodate that poison that you put in it. If you're impaired, you're impaired. One misstep or one misclue is not going to change that phenomenon. It's not going to change the final result. So don't be dissuaded by that. And with that too, you know, you're going to have, if you've got a drug case, you've got a DRE case, you're going to have the notion where the defense attorney is really going to hammer home the fact that, you know, isn't it true that SFSTs are just for alcohol? And, you know, even though our validation studies were developed basically to show that they would show impairment at specific BAC levels, it does not mean that, you know, they didn't show that they were indicative of impairment, which they were, and they showed that, and they recognized that they were, um, used for impairment that they show impairment. Also the manual really recognizes that, you know, it's scientifically validated for alcohol. However, there are various places throughout the manual that talks about impairment by substances, impairment by drugs, including alcohol, which is a drug. And so we really have to be able to recognize that the SFSTs, uh, and here are some uh, other points where in the A-RIDE manual, scientifically validated glues of impairment. Um, and then like the divided attention test, focus on that physical and mental impairment. And like I said, alcohol is a drug um, and drugs impair. So really when we're looking at the SFSTs and what they're demonstrating to us and showing us is that you know they're being used for divided attention. They're being used to show that someone is not necessarily going to be able to perform divi uh, divided attention tasks or even driving tasks, tasks such as being able to keep your car in the proper lane, being able to react to something, uh, whether it be a normal traffic light or whether it be something out of the ordinary, say a pedestrian coming into the middle of the street um, or you know a traffic, a car turning in front of you, et cetera. But it's also used to, to process information. They're used to look at judgment, memory, uh, reaction time, control, coordination. Why is it important that we are coordinated when we're driving? Uh, because if we're not coordinated, we're not going to be able to keep our car in the lane. We're not going to be able to assess the brake when we need to. We're not going to be able to keep pro proper speed. Uh, we're not going to be able to turn our turn signals on if we have issues in, in balance and coordination. Uh, same with the eyes. Uh, Dr. Siddick and Dr. Richmond both do fantastic presentations on how the eyes, if we're not getting enough light, we're not able to focus. Um, and we're not able to do the things that we need to do uh, to drive. So if we've got some impairment in vision, which the HGN and, and some of the other tests will show us, that's an issue. That's a problem. So we need to be able to talk about that uh, when we're testifying. And so here's some other things that I talked about that is in the uh, manual as well. Here's some direct quotes from that. So we have to recognize that they are for drugs, they're really for impairment and assessing impairment. Uh, two, the defense attorneys will come, and I'm going to kind of quickly go over this, but with marijuana uh, specifically, the defense bar really likes to come out and say, you know, all of these studies are showing that, you know, uh, SFSTs are insensitive to marijuana impairment. And quite frankly, um, you know, when you read the whole study, and that's what I say too, is prosecutors, law enforcement, whatnot, if they're citing a, de a defense study or they're citing something, go in and read and see what it really says, because the headlines are a lot different than what the bottom line is. And then also go in and really uh, delve into their methodology. Like who did they use to perform the SFSTs? Did they use people that were actual officers that were trained in doing the SFSTs or did they use just researchers? Um, and look at their methodology and see what all of that has because even though some of them are saying, you know, that they're uh, insensitive or not as sensitive, that's a good thing for us because if they're saying, you know, Marijuana impairment, SFSTs are not as sensitive to, di di uh, to detecting marijuana impairment. What that means is it means that they're not as good as seeing impairment when impairment exists. When they've looked at other you know, avenues and they have determined this person is impaired by cannabis. And then quite frankly, the SFSTs aren't picking up on certain things with cannabis use. So if you are seeing impairment in particular you know, drug individuals, um, marijuana, cannabis, 
and if the studies are saying that it's insensitive, that means that you're seeing somebody who's probably really impaired if the SFSTs are showing that there is that. So the defense attorneys will really try to kind of flip the tables, split the script, and say they're insensitive because they're seeing impairment when, they're, when their impairment doesn't exist. However, it's the opposite. It's impairment exists, and they're not necessarily seeing the amount or level of impairment in the SFSTs that they would if they were drinking alcohol or impaired by alcohol. So remember that, look into that, because that's, that's another thing that defense attorneys really like to do, is they like to say something, and it may be accurate, but if you don't put it in context, um, you, so if you say like there's a study by Marceline Burns that says, you know, essentially our defense attorney likes to come out and say, oh, it means that officers are really bad at smelling uh, the odor of alcohol in somebody and, you know, detecting a BAC level. Well, if you go into that study, it seems as if when the defense attorney is saying it, they're saying, well, they smell alcohol, they, mean, they see impairment and they're overestimating BACs. But if you actually go into that study, it means just the opposite. They smell alcohol. However, they're underestimating BACs based upon the level of odor that they are smelling. So it's really important to go into the studies, dive into them, look at them, read them, and see what it is that they really say, and then call the defense attorney out uh, if you are in a suppression hearing with the judge. Um, so that's just important to remember. So the, to bring it all home, remember the idea that all of the things that we just talked about, regardless of the defense's ploys and tactics, all of those things can be cured by remembering that your arrest decision is based on the totality of the circumstances. And much like in a three-phase arrest decision, each thing informs the other. So if you have this circumstance and it's a it's pretty standard impaired driving arrest, Remember that all of those things inform each other to bring forward the truth. Because when we start thinking about two separate opinions, and I can't claim this because this is Ashley's words, and I think it's genius. The idea that when you're faced with two opposing explanations for the same set of evidence, our brains tend to naturally prefer the explanation that makes the fewest assumptions. That is Occam's razor. And that is pretty much what we're telling you is that the defense wants to draw assumptions. They want to propose alternative conclusions. They want to paint an alternate picture, but they weren't there. They will never be there. Usually a traffic stop is two people one of which is impaired and it's not my officer. So the fewest assumption is what, or what's going to be adopted and everything informs each other basing out of the totality of circumstances. So, <clears throat> especially in impaired driving cases, remember that if we were all sitting around and we were talking about which Tom Hanks movie is best, everybody would probably pick a different one. Um, and then I would give bonus points to somebody who could tell me what uh, Tom uh, Hanks' character in, in uh, Saving Private Ryan's first name was, was just Captain something or other. <coughs> Excuse me. Focus on your sensory observations and your driver's demeanor and attitudes and try to bring your story into focus because what's best for prosecutors is trading on the idea that the jurors have had some experience either drinking, using drugs, or seeing someone drinking or using drugs, and they have already got some closely held belief of what an impaired driver looks like. Our job is to tap into that with our creation of reports as well as our vor dire and how we jury pick and educate our juries as we go forward in the case. So law enforcement, I submit to you that you can control that a little bit. You don't kind of do the whole, what am I seeing? What am I hearing? What am I smelling? Because as much as we love field sobriety tests and numbers and the CSI effect, sometimes that mom sobriety method is just as impactful and important to the non-educated juror or the one that doesn't understand anything about one legs or I can't do those sober. Did he smell drunk? Did he drive drunk? Did he do something that was unsafe? That's a guilty verdict in some folks' minds. So 
remember to focus on what the jury, the jurors are going to hear as much as what you are hearing in the field. So we'll quickly talk about DRE. I know that we're kind of running low on time, um, but you know, we just have to remember, you know, that the defense attorney is going to try to make it seem like the law enforcement officer is trying to diagnose or treat some sort of um, ailment. And that's not the case. And they're gonna also try to say that, you know, the medical community doesn't, you know, really recognize the DRE uh, protocols or that, you know, it, it's not valid for determining intoxication, but this is untrue. And we can see this as, you know, a lot of organizations have supported the DRE protocol. Um, and so they, uh, they will attack it, but they won't have any evidence to show the contrary. So here are some of the other places they'll attack the DRE protocol. They'll really try to attack the manuals, the training, the matrix, because it seems like something that was just pulled out of nothing. Uh, we talked about the validation, uh, the norms as well. How are you gonna know that their client is one way or the other? Uh, they'll, they'll go into tolerance issues and try to say, you know, this person was uses all the time. So they're tolerant and therefore they're not impaired. Um, but if the officer is seeing impairment, the arresting officer seeing impairment, the DRE is seeing impairment, then you know you can certainly have a conversation with that, normal or not, impairment exists, um, tolerant or not, impairment exists, and here are the different things that show that impairment exists. So they're also going to really um, attack the opinion because they're going to say that you know the opinion wasn't a, in, it wasn't formed in a manner in which you know doctors or et cetera form their opinions. And we have to remember that we keep this separate from the doctors. They're not doctors. They're not treating a person. They're not diagnosing an ailment and giving them a treatment prescription. All of our DREs they're doing is just determining whether, whether or not impairment exists. And yeah, there may be a little bit of a medical component to it because of the medical rule out. However, the medical rule out is just for the benefit of the defendant to say, you know, this isn't impairment by a substance or drugs. This is a situation where we need to get this person to the hospital and we need to get them the medical attention that they need. So really we have to remember that we have to focus on what the DRE is really doing and what they aren't doing because the defense attorney is really going to try to make it seem like the, the DRE is doing something that they shouldn't be doing by you know, performing and giving medical things. With that, we have to remember that the things that the, the DREs are doing are pretty standard. A lot of people check their pulse when they're running or exercising. A lot of people check their um, blood pressure because you know they naturally have high, high blood pressure and they have to do it just to make sure their medications are working or just to make sure that they don't have an emergency. We check our children, we check ourselves for fevers um, all the time, we take temperatures. So these are all things that are, are pretty standard but if the defense attorney gets his way, they're going to make it seem like it's something foreign. So we just need to bring that back to the juror's familiarity and have that discussion about this is what they're really looking for versus what the defense attorney wants them to think that they're looking for. Jeff, I'll let you talk real quickly on chemical tests before we end. Yeah, let me, I'll wrap this up real briefly on the, on the chemical test stuff, just a couple of seconds. You know, we were talking about the phases, right? And I added that phase four about chemical testing and I kind of alluded to it at the beginning. Um, you know, phase four is gonna be one of those times where most of those chemical challenges are gonna be an attempt to try to prevent things from coming into evidence. Um, and so we start thinking about, you know, chemical testing. We're gonna look probably towards more like suppression things. And most of those suppression things are gonna come out as some sort of administrative rule issue or you know, an officer error, timing error, something that, you know, the idea that the machine didn't work. So it's important for prosecutors to be focused on the idea that certain things affect admissibility, certain things affect weight. If they want to argue the weight or the fact that there are physical ailments in this particular individual that caused that test to be infirm, that's a weight issue. Judge, you can allow the jury to hear the evidence, and then that's what cross is for, and expert witnesses are paid to get, you know, get up on the stand and talk about. But it doesn't affect the admissibility. As long as you can focus on the admissibility, if that thing comes in, everything else goes to the weight. Judges sometimes don't like to hear that, but when you bring it up, they have to follow the law. Uh, well, they should follow the law, how about that? So uh, moving on to a couple other things, like for example, you know, breath testing issues, specifics, 
you know, diabetes, you know, GERD. Sometimes you hear about people with diabetes having, you know, inflated results or gastroesophageal reflux disease. You know, the body created its own alcohol and you were measuring isopropanol and not ethanol and pity my client because he didn't mean to blow a 14, but you know what? He was fasting and that's how, that's what, you know, just dumb luck. Well, it's just a dumb decision too. But if you want a really good explanation of this, I would tell you to reach out to your TSRP. Uh, Sarah's likely got a bunch of information on specific uh, alcohol impaired driving, chemical testing, breath testing issues. I know that there are some, some publications on those specific things um, you know, from the National Traffic Law Center. Included in those publications are some, uh, some guidance on you know, blood test issues. Now, obviously an expired kit, look, expired kits, if it's an administrative thing, fine. But realistically, an expired kit has to do with the suction of the tube. And so, you know, if you're in the uh, emergency room and somebody's got a needle in their arm and there's red stuff flowing up in that tube, I'm guessing that tube's not expired because the half-life of uh, potassium oxalate and sodium fluoride enter around 500 years. So I'm, not pre I'm pretty sure that's not something you want to put in your body necessarily, but it's definitely going to be long. It's going to live long after we are, and it's going to preserve our bodily fluids if we want to. So um, I'm, not ex I'm not excited about expiration dates. Um, remember, in, ter in terms of like candida albicans or yeast on the skin, uh, great. That's a you know, fanciful, awesome theory. Let's have a science class, but it doesn't affect the admissibility of the case. And then obviously inversion of Graystopper tubes. Um, if that's all they got, then I'm, I'm, I'll meet them at the courthouse and I'll put your guy in jail. So um, I'm not scared of anything. And these things on these, especially these things, and I'm certain that Sarah's got some great guidance for you as well. Um, but I, I don't have anything else to add. Um, Ash, do you want to add anything on those? Uh, no, I don't have anything else to add on that. And um, I can, I know Jeff needs to step away. So I can just, you know, kind of do the last five minutes of this if y'all want to stay on for the last five minutes. And then um, I know that we're kind of a few minutes over time. Um, but I can wrap this up for us, let Jeff go because I know he needs to get to trial. And then uh, if you need to listen to it on the recording later on, feel free to go back. But uh, if you've got anything else, Jeff, I'll let you do your last comments and then I'll, I'll wrap this up. I just want to encourage you guys to keep moving forward. Do not be afraid of any of these cases. The defense is full of a lot of hot air and a lot of bluster. Um, I look forward to the opportunity to see my North Carolina folks in person, hug your necks. Uh, Sarah, thanks for having me. Ashley, you know, I don't no, have I to know. tell you. Um, right. I'm going to go, I'm going to go close this case, give it to the jury and make them convict this guy and put him in jail for 10 years. So be safe. God bless you all. I'll talk to y'all later. Thanks. All right. Fantastic. Thank you, Jeff. All right. So really with the end, the end of this and what you need to do is kind of like your final method for making sure that you are reviewing your case, preparing for the defense and going that. So first of all, you need to listen. You need to really make sure that you're taking notes. Um, officers, make sure that you're listening on the scene. Prosecutors, make sure you're listening to your officers. Um, ask questions too. Make sure that you know, you're know you asking the right questions on the scene and then prosecutors that you're asking the right questions of your law enforcement officers. This will also help with you know just relationships down the, the road. It will also help with your cases as you go on because if you're asking the questions, then you know the officers are gonna start to recognize what you're going to need for them for better development of cases. Um, and then you know you can also get a lot of information from your law enforcement officers too, that they know things that you may not know. Uh, verify everything. So if the defense attorney is making claims about things, and we talked about this a little bit with the studies, make sure that you go verify that what they're saying is actually true. And also there could be multiple inter interpretations to the evidence or to the, state, the studies they're trying to use or to the you know, manual. So make sure that you're verifying it. And if you have to ask you know, the quote unquote dumb questions, ask them, understand them, because if you don't understand it, then your jury sure as heck isn't gonna understand it either. So make sure that you're asking the questions, that you're getting the information that you need, that you're verifying that. And Jeff talked about that simple version, that, Occ that Occam's razor, that 
really, if there's too much stuff being thrown out there, if they're throwing the kitchen sink at the, you know, the jurors, they're probably not going to believe everything. So if you can wrap it up into one neat bow and say, really, folks, the only thing here that is even remotely possible is impairment. The only thing that everything we've seen today that can be explained by one thing and one thing alone, and that is impairment, even though they may have alternative explanations, impairment covers the gamut and, and covers everything. And then frame your, your case to your, you know, your statute, to your jury instructions. Make sure that you're having the right jury instructions to show the elements of your statute, the elements of your case, um, and then bringing that all back when you're in opening, when you're in direct, when you're in closing, and that you're feeding that through the entire trial process. Also consider, you know, the weather changes. And so we need to have, you know, explanations of where we are with our weather. Um, and, and if you've got a, a case of weather, I know that you guys are having a lot of weather down there right now. So if the SFSTs are something that, you know, you, you have the weather issues, talk about it. Be honest about it. Be upfront about it. Talk about the things that you did to overcome for those things um, and the things that you took into account when you were doing the SFSTs, because that all helps you uh, and especially if you're bringing it out and you're saying okay we may have a couple of issues uh, and this is it and then if it hurts your case we're talking about the issues you know same with the defense attorney they take the same approach if it hurts your case it really only needs to be said once so making sure that you bring it to the attention of the jurors that you messed up something but you don't have to hammer on it you don't have to harp on it uh, the defense attorney will definitely do that for you. So make sure that you have a reasonable explanation for why things occurred the way that they did. And then lastly, you just need to reinforce. So making sure that you repeat those, that evidence that was important to your case. Make sure that that strong evidence and the things that really demonstrate impairment, that they are reinforced, that they are repeated, and that your case is strong because even though they're trying to attack all of these other things, really at the end of the day it just comes back to impairment and you can demonstrate an impairment because these things all build on top of each other and they demonstrate and show that impairment so if anybody has any questions i'm happy to stick around and answer to the best of my ability i apologize for going a little bit over but if you need uh to get a hold of jeff or i um here is our contact information and uh, our phone numbers our our Mine is my cell phone, so feel free to call, text, whatever. And then also our email addresses are on there as well. Um, thank you so much for having us here today. And I will turn it over to Eugene. Ashley, thank you very much for a terrific presentation today. Um, and I appreciate you being willing to um, stay a little bit longer for uh, any questions that we might have coming up. Just a reminder for folks to, um, if you have any question, um, you can easily just raise your hand and I'll let you uh, speak that question or you can um, uh, type it in quickly to the um, uh, Q&A window. Um, and that contact information that um, Ashley put on the screen, we'll provide that in a follow-up email to you as well. So if you've got any questions um, offline that you'd like to ask either Ashley or Jeff. So uh, while we're waiting for uh, any final questions, uh, I wanna recognize Sarah again to see if you had any follow-up uh, questions for Ashley. Yeah, just one real quick thing. Ashley, one of the things that that I experience, and I know you do too, is when there's a, a defense to something that is just ridiculous, but they seem to be able to sell it to the judge. I, for example, today I got an email about how um, one of the things that's flying right now in one part of North Carolina is the defense attorney is arguing that since his client refused the breath or the blood test pursuant to implied consent, that the officer cannot go and get a search warrant because the defendant chose the option of having his license revoked as a result of refusing to take the, you know, give a chemical analysis and it violates the fourth amendment. Now that is so stupid mm -hmm. that there's not a case that's gonna be on point with it. Well, what do you suggest when it's just, I mean, it, it's just, it is essentially, they're arguing aliens came and the judge is nodding their head going, hmm, potentially that could have happened. Well, do you got any, any words of wisdom other than beating your head against concrete wall, which is my first go-to? <laughs> right? No, I totally, well, first of all, I suggest you guys get a statute like ours that explicitly allows for a search warrant after refusal. But mm -hmm. without that, I would definitely just 
go back to reasonableness. And that's sometimes it's hard to do because I get kind of wrapped up in defense attorneys, uh, defenses and their claims and forget like, this doesn't make any sense. So I feel like sometimes, you know, the judges do buy it, but if you're good at kind of bringing them back to the basics, bringing them back to like reasonableness, Mm -hmm. uh, which it can be hard to do, but that's what I say is just kind of go back and say, you know, uh, in your case, you know, it, it doesn't really matter whether or not they were agreeing to have their license taken away. Like, uh, it's still evidence in a case and it's still, you know, for a search warrant, I feel like this is the hardest thing for me because we have these arguments in Wyoming because even though we're allowed to get a search warrant, there are some jurisdictions that don't actually execute the search warrant because they're refusing to, you know, and they won't take a forced draw. And so some ju- judges, they <laughs> they have weird issues with that. But my argument usually for that is we execute search warrants for all sorts of other things. And this is a crime. And so if somebody was standing at the door and saying, no, I'm not going to let you search my house. Well, what do we do? Like, there's not a judge in the world that would be like, oh, no, you can't, you know, you can't, can't execute my order uh, just because the defendant said no. So I think sometimes just going back to the basics, sometimes just taking a deep breath and really just starting from what you know, like Law 101, starting from the beginning can really help uh, guide that judge back to hey, this is crazy. And so you need to see it that way. Because if we look at the law very simplistically, even though the law isn't simple, uh, that can sometimes help. Is that kind of what you were looking for? Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, and I agree with you. I think sometimes we, we get so flustered by the ridiculous of arguments that we start to believe them ourselves. And, um, and the argument that it violates the fourth amendment to do what the fourth amendment requires you to do is just I mean, it's so insane that, I mean, my initial thought was, well, no, no, wait a minute. Do I need to look this up? And I was like, no, the sky's blue. You're telling <laughs> it's, me it's not. <laughs> it's, it's asinine. And really what I find is they just make these claims that are so over the top that we have to sometimes sit back and think like, what is it they're actually claiming? Because right. sometimes what they're trying to say they're claiming is not really what they are are claiming. And the laws and the, the case law they're citing that, that, you know, supports their claim doesn't even remotely support what they're trying to say. Because I find that happens a lot, too. So just going back and looking at, you know, what they're relying on for their law and why they think that, you know, that case is supportive of their argument, going yeah. back and rereading that helps, too. Exactly. Yeah. And just understanding that, you know, for a lot of these, uh, a lot of these cases, there's no particular silver bullet. It just requires <laughs> common sense. I mean, it's just uh, yeah. common sense. Yep, exactly. 100%. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Eugene, and I, uh, Eugene, I don't see any questions up here, but I tell you what, if somebody thinks of something or if when they're going back through or, or watching this podcast, I'm a podcast, watching this, <laughs> this webinar, you know, on a recording, um, feel free to to email Jeff, email Ashley, email me, and I can communicate with them too. But, you know, that that Jeff might be an assistant DA now, but he's a TSRP at heart still. So, you know, between me, Ashley, and Jeff, if we don't know the answer, we will know somebody who does. Yes. Sarah, thank you very much. And again, um, in a follow-up email that we'll be sending out to all of our participants today, we'll include Sarah's, uh, Ashley, and Jeff's contact information. So as Sarah said, we don't have any more questions in the queue. Uh, So I wanna take this time now to thank again, Ashley and Jeff for excellent presentations, as well as to Sarah Garner for being a part of today's presentation. Thanks to everyone who's joined us. Um, If you um, uh, wish before you leave uh, the meeting, if you have any suggestions or comments or questions that you wanna um, we can uh, address offline. Go ahead and pop them into the Q&A window, um, particularly if you've got any uh, recommendations on how to improve the webinar series, including future topics that you'd like to learn more about. Um, following today's webinar, as I m- mentioned, you'll get an email uh, with the recording link, so be sure to watch for that email. The email will also include a link so that you can request a webinar participation certificate if you'd like to get that for your records. Um, So just 
click on the link in the email and you'll be able to request that and we'll email that to you. Uh, do note, if you are watching this as the recording and not the live webinar, only participants in the live webinar may receive a certificate. We're unable to award them just for viewing the recording. Um, we want to invite you to join us again for other traffic safety webinars planned for this series uh, at this website. You can uh, go to uh, this, this link and see a listing of the upcoming webinars we have uh, in, in the series for this year. Also at the same website, you'll find information about the next North Carolina Traffic Safety Conference and Expo, which will be coming up uh, next summer um, in August. And we do hope you will plan to attend that conference. And we invite you to propose topics for presentation. You can uh, find a link on the website for presentation proposals. Uh, for example, if you'd like to know more about this topic and hear from these two great presenters, let us know. Uh, we'd be happy to bring them into our uh, uh, conference. So with that, I want to thank everyone again for participating in today's webinar. And until next time, goodbye for now.